Well, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Christina Williamson, and our panel is Data Driven uh, Recreation Planning. I'm here with Mila Bach, Tyler Lee, and Lauren Atkinson. So, we're going to try to keep you guys awake on the last panel uh, Friday afternoon. So, prepare to be. <laughs> so, land managers struggle to strike a balance between visitor freedom and ecological integrity. So, what does that mean? Um, so, when it comes to public lands, obviously we want to protect the natural resources, but we also want the public to have access to those um, lands. And that's one of the things that all of our projects focus on, and we're going to talk a little bit about the different ways that different agencies do that. Um, our agencies come from the Nevada chapter of the Nature Conservancy with Mila, so we have the um, nonprofit sector of it. My project is with the Bureau of Reclamation and the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife, so we have the federal and the state side of it. And then Tyler and Warren come from the United States Forest Service, specifically in wilderness areas, and they're going to talk about ways that we balance that in wilderness areas. And to give you an idea, this is where all of our um, projects come from. So I'm up in the state of Washington. Mila did hers in California. And then Tyler and Lauren are in the state of Colorado near Aspen. Um, data can often be the key that managers need to establish um, a balance. And so each presentation is going to build on the different ways data collection informs land managers and aids in decision making to protect resources and improve visitor experiences. So Mila will be building the foundation for that process. Um, mine will be managing visitor impacts by establishing baseline data out in the field. Uh, Tyler will be implementing implementation and realization through uh, data collection in a concentrated wilderness area. And then Lauren's going to show us the best management practices for the least amount of impact to wilderness in a dispersed wilderness area. And so we'd just like to finish off this introduction and start you on our panel with a quote from Alba Leopold. I have purposely presented the land ethic as a product of social evolution because nothing so important as an ethic is ever written. It evolves in the minds of a thinking community. So the question is, can we as land managers educate the public to protect these resources responsibly so that um, we can keep having this good public access for them? Thank you. And I now turn it over to Mila. I'll be watching online. I'll be back with the pens. Sorry. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. There you go. Okay. Um, Thank you, Christina, for that introduction, and thank you to you all for um, taking the time to be here today. Um, uh, like Christina said, my name is Mila Bach, and I'm going to be talking to you about conservation and recreation, um, and doing so through the case study of managing visitation on a nature preserve. Um, but before I dive into my project, a uh, quick show of hands, how many of you find value in spending time outside? Welcome to an MEM forum. Um, so I want you to think quickly or just ponder up like what that value looks like to you. Um, what attributes in nature are you really attributing value to? Um, and I'm not going to ask you to share those out loud, but I'm going to share with you some quotes that I received um, during my research. So whether it be um, an intrinsic value such as beauty or solitude, or perhaps um, just habitat for wildlife, or the opportunity to connect with another part of your life. Um, nature often holds value for a number of people in a number of different ways. Um, and so my presentation seeks to describe a story about how to artfully preserve those values in nature. I'm going to do so by um, first introducing you to the Nature Conservancy, my partner organization. Um, then we'll introduce you to the landscape that we are working on, um, some potential threats to that land, and how my research sought to address those threats. So to begin with, um, the Nature Conservancy is a global conservation organization uh, with the mission of conserving the lands and waters in which all life depends. Um, while they work internationally, they also um, do a ton of work here within the U.S. Um, and they manage roughly 400 uh, nature preserves, many of which are open to the public. Um, they've got four key focus areas, and if you guys saw um, Kimberly's presentation, you'll know that they do amazing work in all four sectors. 
Um, this is the landscape that we're going to be talking about. This is Independence Lake. It's located in um, northeastern California, just north of Lake Tahoe. Um, it's the headwaters to the Truckee River, which flows into Nevada. Um, and it was historically part of this orange blob, which is Lahontan Lake. So during the last ice, ice age, roughly 8,500 square miles of land was covered in water. Um, and this became home to the endemic species of the Lahontan cutthroat trout. Um, as that lake dried up, the trout were left in various um, bod bodies of water um, throughout this region, but due to habitat degradation and overfishing, they are nearly extirpated from this entire region in the 1800s. Independence Lake, however, is special in that it's always maintained this historic population of fish. Um, and this lake in particular is um, the only lake in California to hold a wild self-sustaining population of LCT, and it's only one of two in the world. In addition to um, this trout, um, this area is um, surrounded by relatively pristine forest and meadow, wet meadows. Um, and for all these natural values, the Nature Conservancy um, sought to conserve this in um, in perpetuity, that's the word, um, by acquiring it in 2010. Um, when they did so, they incorporated this into their um, preserve program. Um, so now Independence Lake Preserve is managed by the Nevada chapter of the Nature Conservancy. They have three main ecological goals. Um, one is to sustain that population of fish, um, also to maintain ecological integrity, and to preserve the forests, or to manage the forests. Um, but they also have this management goal of allowing public access on the landscape um, in a way that's consistent with those ecological goals. And this is a bit of a management conundrum, if you will. Um, how does one manage for a rare population of trout while also allowing recreation to, to take place um, in that same area? So in order to wrestle with that um, management question, TNC commissioned a um, consulting firm to administer a survey during their first year of operation in the summer of 2010. Um, and this survey sought to understand a baseline understanding of their visitors. Um, the data from this report has helped to inform management decisions and it set a protocol for this estimated maximum visitation. So you'll see that visitation has grown pretty dramatically in the last seven years. Um, and this increase has led managers to really consider what does this mean in terms of their ecological goals um, or in short are there too many people coming to this place um, and so that's where my research comes in broadly speaking there's kind of two ways to manage or to measure um, human impacts on the landscape one is to measure the landscape and the other is to man or to measure the humans my background as a field biologist is um, far more suited to manage the former, <coughs> um, but this is an MEM project, and uh, as land managers, it's super important to be able to understand how to manage people as well as the landscape. So um, in conversation with TNC, we decided that measuring the people would be the way to go, and we conducted a follow-up visitor use survey last summer. There was two objectives for this survey. One was to reassess visitor use patterns and demographics as compared to the 2010 data. And the other was to identify visitor knowledge um, and values about this landscape. So the survey started um, in late June and went through mid-September of last summer. Um, this was a voluntary survey with two means of distribution. One was self-selected participation and the other I would actively canvas the beaches around Independence Lake and solicit um, participation that way. I had 26 questions in total. Um, some, like question number one, are direct replicates from 2010. Others, like question 10, were added adaptations to that 2010 survey. Um, and the remainder were original questions that I came up with in order to get a better sense of who was coming to the preserve, how they understood it, how they valued it. Um, and then I had one question, like question number 12, um, which was open-ended. So in total, we received 255 survey responses, and we can look at some of that data. So like we've seen, visitation is increasing, um, but you'll notice that 2018 saw roughly the same number of visitors as 2017. So at this point in time, it's unclear whether or not this is a momentary lull in what will continue to be increased visitation, 
or if this is a leveling off period. But I want to draw your attention to this green line. Um, my survey asked uh, visitors to report their group size average, or their group size, um, and I used that to reestablish a group size average. So in 2010, um, 2.88 people were calculated to um, be in a group. Um, my data said 3.36, but when I started looking at this, I realized that this was incorporating group sizes of 8, 10, 15 people. The way that this maxima visited, maximum um, visitation calculation works is you're applying this average group size number to car counts, and 10 people didn't come out of one car. So to more accurately represent what we think or keep the number of people um, coming per vehicle, I readjusted this to 2.36. Um, and that drops um, total visitation pretty dramatically. In terms of visitor profile, you'll see that um, Independence Lake is here where the pin is. The majority of folks are coming from California, um, but when you zoom into this square, um, what is the greater Lake Tahoe Basin area, um, data suggests that we are getting more um, localized visitation from this region than we were in 2010, uh, which is great. Um, you also see here that there is a 10% increase in reoccurring visitors. So folks are coming back to Independent Lake. Um, and while my questions varied slightly in terms of age, overall it appears that we're uh, receiving a younger overall demographic um, with an av largest average um, age between 30 and 50. Um, in terms of recreation trends, I want to draw your attention to these two bars to begin with. This dark teal is 2018 data, and you'll see a 10% increase in the use of watercrafts. This is likely due to this watercraft program that was introduced um, in partnership with TNC and Trucky Donner Land Trust, um, and they sought to provide the free use of um, motorboats and kayaks at the lake um, in order to provide historic um, recreational opportunities while also allow, or diminishing the potential introduction of aquatic invasive species. Um, you'll see here, another interesting thing to note, that there's a pretty dramatic decline in popularity of hiking, um, but swimming has increased. So overall, it appears that in 2018, um, recreators were coming mainly for aquatic resources um, and less on terrestrial. In terms of knowledge, um, I sought to understand how familiar visitors were with um, the management agencies and some of those natural resources. Um, you'll see here that in green, folks have a general pretty good understanding of um, the fish itself, but there is certainly room for improvement. As you can see, more than 20% of um, visitors did not know that this is a federally threatened species or um, that it's vulnerable to invasives. In terms of values, this is a really hard thing to measure. Um, so I chose to do so by um, looking at ecosystem services. Um, for those of you who don't know, ecosystem services are a way to quantify the values that people receive from the natural, um, natural environment. Uh, there's four broad categories, habitat supporting services, cultural, regulatory, and provisioning services. And by creating statements that were uh, informed by these ecosystem service types, I then asked visitors to rank these statements. These are the top five ranked statements. And as you can see, both TNC and visitors saw the provision of wildlife habitat to be the most important ecosystem service to this region. However, there's kind of a departure between what TNC sees as important and what visitors um, uh, give value to. Um, so again, there's some room for improvement or education there. Um, all of this data culminates in the following management implications. In terms of visitation rate, um, again, we're not sure which direction that trend line is going to go, um, but it is possible that due to that calculation discrepancy, um, management plans have already incorporated future visitation growth into um, those management plans. Um, Visitation uh, demographics have changed with a more localized and reoccurring <coughs> visitor base. Um, it provides management an awesome opportunity to connect with those familiar visitors 
um, and potentially promote a volunteer base um, that could help with management capacity, especially on busy weekends. So as you guys have heard throughout this week's panels, education can be a huge asset um, for land management. Um, and while my data shows that visitors seem to be fairly familiar with some of the natural resources and share similar values to TNC, there is room for improvement and education really could fill that gap um, between those objectives and perceptions. Um, and lastly, in terms of watercraft use, because this is overwhelmingly the most popular activity at the preserve, um, this again provides a great opportunity for managers to have those targeted interactions um, with that demographic of users um, as a nonprofit that gives them a great opportunity to solicit donations um, and also just to share the amazing conservation work that they're doing. So to tie this all up, um, data, the, my project is an example of data used for preventative management. By understanding the visitors that are coming to this preserve, um, managers can now target develop targeted educational material um, they can that will promote pro-environmental behavior and help to instill that land ethic at the preserve. Generally speaking, um, as my panel mates will continue to, to say, um, collecting data early can really help managers identify problems and get ahead of them before they become overwhelming. And ultimately, this can become, this can be an important tool that managers can use for balancing what we said before, that freedom of visitors and ecological integrity. So with that, I want to give a tremendous thank you to my advisor, Dr. Corey Knapp, and to um, Dr. Melody Armstrong, um, as well as the Haley Fund and my community sponsor, Chris Fichtel, as well as all of um, TNC Nevada. And a big thank you to my family and friends, and again, you all for taking the time to be here. data around the watercraft usage and invasive species introduction and in the lake? Um, so prior 2010 data was looking for perceived threats when they were um, uh, surveying. And most visitors agreed that aquatic invasives was a pretty critical threat. Um, and so that was part of the reason like they got buy-in from um, visitors that very first year that said this is an issue and they don't want it to become a pollutant into um, this particular lake and so they use that as sort of a metric to say by introducing this um, in in basin watercraft program we can just eliminate that threat and there's a pretty i mean kids walk in with like pool noodles and we don't let those in because they're just giant sponges and vectors or those sorts of things <laughs> yeah um other questions Another question. Yeah. Um, I was lucky to get to visit you at this very beautiful place. And I know that you were working with a very small local staff within a much larger organization. Can you talk about some of the challenges in support and running a project like this within like a really close-knit local community, but then also networking upwards to that bigger organization? Yeah. Wow. So as you probably noticed, Independence Lake lies in California, but it's managed by the Nevada chapter of the Nature Conservancy. So that in and of itself is a bit of a, um, a quandary. It's because of the way that the watershed works. So the Truckee River flows into Nevada, and the Nevada chapter already has a really established, um, they've done a bunch of work on the Truckee River already within Nevada. Um, but there's actually a ton of partnership between the two. Um, <coughs> California, as most of you know as well, is a big money maker. There's a ton of tech money there. And so the fundraising opportunities coming from California is really optimal. And Independence Lake is a great place to bring donors for that. Um, so I'd say that there's a pretty nice collective effort in those two broader chapters. But bringing it down into the localized area um, yeah, this lake has, it's been around for a long time and there's been many years where this has been open to a public in a very different demographic. Um, so there was some pushback because of 
how small those communities are and how people really do instill values and kind of have these long histories and heritages with a place. And so the fact that TNC can come in and now promote it as something that isn't just the, the family key secret um, can be a challenge. And so working really hard with those stakeholders <coughs> to create that buy-in, um, both yeah, at the local level and then across both of those state chapters has been an interesting learning experience. Hi, Mila. Uh, question for you as a as a land manager. So you you have those uh, survey responses and where the importance were of these different categories for the respondents as compared to the TNC. Yeah. You offer that there's an opportunity there for education of those survey respondents to, to kind of align people more closely with the TNC values. As a land manager, what's the role of an organization um, not only educating, but listening to those survey respondents and adjusting their values accordingly? Um, I think ultimately you have to look at what TNC's mission statement is. Um, while they do recognize the value of bringing people out onto the landscape to instill those connections and people care once they've connected to the land, um, they're still out to conserve things. They do not want, and they, I'm assuming they will not sacrifice this fish population just because people are like, I would rather catch and take than catch and release. Um, so I think you're right. I think that this is an, a window into what visitors are thinking, um, but with conservation management as sort of the, the backdrop to the way that TNC functions, um, I would say at this point, it's best to bring their message to the surface um, and then create more of a conversation um, to incorporate visitors' um, thoughts. Yeah. Got time for one more? Are there plans by TNC or whomever to continue this monitoring program, this survey program, to um, again stay ahead of what's going on in the area? It's possible. So this project was partly born out of the idea that um, that 2010 consultant said re revisiting this survey procedure would be beneficial. Um, so I think that's part of the reason why this was such an easy thing to um, get moving as they already had it in their head that this was something that should be done in the future. Um, and yeah, I think in terms of adaptive management, that's a pretty classic way to um, just continue to recheck your baseline. Um, so while I haven't spoken to them specifically about um, what the next 10 years would hold and how they would redo this survey, um, I wouldn't be surprised if it's something that they kept in their toolbox. Hi, it's me again, in Williamson. Um, so, like I mentioned before, I did my project with the Bureau of Reclamation and the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. And so I'm going to be talking about managing visitor impacts in the Columbia Basin Project through data collection and site assessment inventory. Um, I work at the Grand Coulee Dam Power Office in Grand Coulee, Washington, under the Public Affairs Office as a Reclamation Guide. <clears throat> so Reclamation's mission statement is that the mission of the Bureau of Reclamation is to manage, develop, excuse me, develop and protect water and related resources in an environmentally and economically sound manner in the interest of the American public. If you notice in there, there's nothing mentioned about recreation. We're not really a recreation type of agency. Um, to understand recreation and Grand Coulee Dam and the Columbia Basin Project, I'll give you a little bit of history real fast. So Grand Coulee Dam and the Columbia Basin Project were projects under Franklin Delano Roosevelt's New Deal uh, during the Great Depression. And in America at that time, only about 25% or 25% of the population was unemployed. So there was focus on these big projects to put people to work. And so we did employ between 8,000 and 10,000 workers. Now in the 1930s, recreation wasn't really on anybody's radar. And so later on, as um, recreation <laughs> came about and all these different um, recreation areas started to pop up, we ran into a bit of a conundrum because by law, we had to have recreations. 
<clears throat> excuse me, specifically written into the project plans itself. And it wasn't originally written into these project plans. So this is the Columbia Basin project. Um, this large green area here located mostly in eastern and central Washington. Uh, this is kind of an inset that gives you an idea more of um, some of the towns that it's in. It's in the Big Bend area of the Columbia River, so this big sea here. Um, the John W. Keyes pumping plant at Grand Coulee Dam, which is this area here, actually pumps water from the Columbia Basin up into reservoirs. Um, and it is the largest irrigation project in the United States. This is just a little more information about where it's located, uh, three counties. We cover about 1.1 million acres with the project, and we irrigate about 671,000 acres, or an area roughly the size of the state of Rhode Island. So it's a very, very large project. Um, we only use about 2% of the annual flow from the Columbia River, so it's a very, very small amount of water that's actually used, considering how large this project actually is. And its main reason is irrigation, and as I mentioned, recreation is a secondary priority. But we run into some unique problems or unique instances where most of the area is made up of human engineered natural resources development. Um, so we have about 6,000 miles of irrigation canals and ditches, which make up um, all the access or these recreation areas. And it creates all these large reservoirs, mostly man made, like Banks Lake, Potholes, Pinto, Billy Clap Lake, and a few more that are down there. And like I mentioned before, recreation was not originally um, in the project plans. So because of this, reclamation could only provide very minimal services to the public. So pretty much a parking area, maybe a toilet, and that's pretty much about it. So it wasn't the best user experience for anybody who wanted to go out and recreate in these areas. So under the 1965 Federal Water Project Recreation Act, we were actually able to start teaming up with um, other managing partners. And so for the Columbia Basin Project, Reclamation teamed up with the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife so that they could manage these areas and provide better services that Reclamation wasn't able to um, statutorily provide. And so what are some of the um, recreation opportunities in the Columbia Basin? There's a plethora of them. Uh, we have year-round recreation, so you can go there in the wintertime, you can go there in the summertime, springtime, anytime. Um, one of the big things is birding. The creation of the Columbia Basin Project actually became a very integral part of the Pacific Flyway. So it uh, creates a lot of wetlands and nesting areas for migratory birds. Boating, obviously because of all the water. Camping, cross-country skiing, fishing. We have world-class fishing there. Um, hiking, rock climbing, ice fishing, kayaking. It just keeps going on and on and on and on. <laughs> um, Off-road vehicle use as well. Swimming water skiing, and then wildlife viewing. So the state of Washington created all these wildlife management areas, so we have a lot of wildlife that goes through the area, which provides a lot of hunting opportunities as well during hunting season for waterfowl and other animals. So there are 13 management areas within the Columbia Basin Project, and there are 66 total recreation sites within these 13 different units. Um, and so what I was doing for my project was conducting comprehensive condition assessments of these areas. So while the state of Washington is still managing these sites, Reclamation still owns them. So we have an obligation to go out there and to assess these areas and to make sure that they are up to par for different um, conditions that I'm going to talk about. And under the Real Property Executive Order uh, 13327, it requires all of Department of Interior bureaus to conduct these comprehensive condition, condition assessments every five years on constructed assets of more than $50,000. And so my methods. So I conducted um, assessments at 30 of those recreation sites throughout the basin, and I obtained information from about 275 different recreation amenities at these sites. So I stayed very, very busy during the summer. <laughs> so my methods. So how did I conduct these? Well, I can sit up here and I can just read off of this, or I can show you exactly how I did it. So I pulled out my handy dandy little requisite <laughs> MEM cap, <laughs> put it on. <laughs> Pulled out my government issued iPad with the ArcGIS 123 survey software on it, and I started going to town, visiting these different areas. And so there were a lot of different things that were within the software that I was um, looking at. I was looking at um, specific details about the amenities. So, what did we have there? Did we have boat ramps? Did we have marinas? Did we have bathrooms? Uh, were there hiking trails? Were there wild uh, viewing areas? Different things like that. Some of these places were extremely large. You could fit probably 100 cars there, 
Other of them were barely the size of this room, and they might have one access point where you would go out and go fishing, or several boat ramps or several marinas, different things like that. So they varied in several different sizes. <clears throat> um, one of the most important things was rating them. Were they good? Were they fair? Were they poor? This was rather subjective um, based on my experience with the different sites and what I found. Um, and then one of the most important things was our DSIS recommendations, which is the dam safety information systems. And so they had three different priorities. The first one was something that was immediate response required, which basically meant, oh my gosh, this is really, really bad. You guys, by law, have to fix this immediately. Uh, the second one was uh, required in a timely manner. So it was something like, okay, this is bad, but you guys don't have to get on it right this very second, but you're going to have to eventually get around to fixing this. And then the third one was recommended not required. So I made a recommendation, hey, um, you guys need to fix this, but you're not required by law, but it would probably help out at the site if you guys did that. Um, there were also condition notes for natural resources. Um, I was looking at vegetation, including any sort of noxious weed issues. Um, any sort of erosion issues. Obviously, you have a lot of water through there, and the water moves because we're pumping it and it's being used for irrigation. And then resource damage and unauthorized use. So we were looking for any litter and vandalism issues. And there was a lot of litter, a lot of vandalism issues with graffiti. Um, some of these places are near fairly large towns, so people would go out there and unfortunately destroy some of them. And then any hazardous conditions, like natural or man-made. <clears throat> we did have large fires that went through the area last year. So that did cause a lot of issues with um, buildings that were damaged, uh, resources that were damaged, access to roadways. A lot of the roads were washed out. So if you didn't have like a four wheel drive vehicle, it would be very hard in your Honda Civic or something to get out and to go try to recreate in some of these areas. So those are some of the recommendations that need to be made. And then as I mentioned, the overall site or overall condition of the site. So was it in good condition, fair condition, poor condition, et cetera. Um, some of the big things that I was looking for, public health and safety, that was kind of the biggest issue. Were these areas safe for the public to go out to? Um, some of the bathrooms are overflowing, same, they didn't have toilet paper. Some of them looked like they hadn't been uh, maintained in years. It was pretty awful. Um, accessibility. So we worked very closely um, under ADA and ABA, the Architectural Barriers um, Act to see if these sites were accessible for disabled persons. And then we wanted to know what the visitor behavior was out there. What were people doing? Were they using these areas for fishing, boating, hiking? So I was kind of taking an informal surveys about that. Um, and what I found, as I mentioned, that most of the sites were in poor condition. Um, there were lots of road accessibility issues. Um, and parking and the camping areas were not accessible. And as you can see, this was one of the fire rings that I found when somebody just had to leave their pants behind. <laughs> I believe Tyler said, liar, liar, pants on fire. <laughs> um, so the buildings were in poor conditions. Some of them had rodent infestations. You can actually see this uh, sign here is one that was completely covered in graffiti. People like to shoot the signs out there as well, so there were a lot of bullet holes in a lot of the signs that I found. Um, and some of the interpretive and informational signage some of it was non-existent or in severe needing of being replaced. So it was very faded. A lot of it was um, ripped or torn or just taken down for whatever reason. And then people were definitely not follow leave no trace ethics, as you saw from that fire ring with somebody leaving their pants behind. <laughs> <laughs> so the Washington State Recreation and Conservation Office conducted a survey with Eastern Washington University in 2017. And so we kind of consulted this survey to see what kind of um, needs people were um, looking for for recreational sites in the state of Washington. It did focus just on people who lived in the state of Washington. It didn't focus on anybody outside that would use the areas for recreation. Um, I did notice just from going out to the sites, some of the cars had Oregon tags on, California, Texas. Those were kind of the main areas that I saw people from outside of the state of Washington um, coming from. <clears throat> it broke it down into geographical locations, and so the Columbia Basin Project fell into the Columbia Plateau, and it took it from four different counties, Douglas, Grant, Adams, and Lincoln, and then these are just the respondents that they surveyed. And just to give you an idea, this was a very small representative population, because in 2017, the total population of the four counties was 167,188 people. But 22% um, of the respondents stated that they did encounter barriers to recreation when they were going to these sites. Um, and like things that I mentioned, poor bathroom conditions, undesirable park conditions, campground availability, accessibility issues, and the lack of maintenance to these different facilities. Um, 
And as I mentioned, they were consistent with the findings. I actually came across this sign. It wasn't even on the Fish and Wildlife website that a large area was locked due to vandalism because it was just that bad. And I had to go in and hike about 12 and a half miles to hit all these different recreational sites that were originally accessible by car. And Washington <coughs> closed it off because there was so much damage and people weren't taking care of it. So the desired outcomes of this project is we hope to have better communication between reclamation, uh, fish and wildlife, and the third party concessionaires that we have. We do have a couple of different um, private entities out there that are running some of these sites with campgrounds and marinas and things like that. Um, we want to provide, continue providing a holistic on-site review of these recreational sites. We're hoping to get more money for site improvements. So currently reclamation matches dollar for dollar with the state of Washington up to $100,000 for these re um, recreation sites. And then obviously we want to have better visitor experiences and better natural resource management. And we do that through education. And as Mila mentioned, you know, that's a common theme that you guys have probably heard throughout this is education, education, education. And then improve public health, safety, and accessibility. Um, and we hope to continue monitoring this through this assessment program and educate the visitors and managers about issues and recommendations and needs. And the state of Washington has already kind of started to get on that, as you can see with this invasive species sign. They don't have rangers out there actively um, conducting inspections of boats, so it's pretty much left up to the honor system right now for people who are recreating out there. But that could be another recommendation that's made that maybe we could get funding to have a full-time AIS program going on at these different sites. So I want to thank a few people. I want to thank Dr. Melanie Armstrong, who's my advisor, um, Eve Skillman, who was my community sponsor through Reclamation, Aaron Bell, who was our GIS coordinator, Sean Kinney, who is our ADA and ABA accessibility coordinator, the Reclamation Afraid of Field Office, Lynn Brower, who is my direct supervisor, who got me set up with this program at uh, Grand Coulee, the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife, my MEM final panel group, and then all my friends and family who put up with me for the last couple of years while I was going through all this and all the stresses. So thank you guys very much. question. Oh boy. All right. <laughs> it's a long one, so here we go. <laughs> from, uh, Genevieve. She said, understanding this is about recreation assessment, not wildlife and public health, etc. Can we ask if consideration is ever made to stop recreation for the sake of flora and fauna, short term or long term? That was one question. And then, with all the vandalism, is there a move to develop a new recreation area culture, pride and stewardship? How do we do that? How can we bridge the gap between apathy and destruction with the user groups? I would say for the first question, that's kind of like even broader than my project itself, just comes to all land, land management uh, issues. I guess that we try to avoid closures of areas, um, like I showed you the one where it said the South Gate was closed for vandalism issues. We don't want to restrict public access, um, but we do want to protect these natural resources. So I think, unfortunately, that's kind of one of the necessary evils that comes along with trying to um, <clears throat> do land management. And I think that goes back to the education portion where you're trying to educate the public and your visitors of, hey, you know, you guys are out here recreating. We have these natural resources here and we want to protect them. So try to be better stewards of the land. And I think if we can continue that and get that idea out there into people's minds, then maybe we can change those issues and not have so many closures and not have to go down that route. And then what was the second question? <laughs> Sorry. Um, I think it was, I think you kind of hit that too. It was in, with vandalism, and the, is there a move to developing a new <coughs> area culture, pride and stewardship, bridging the gap between apathy and destruction within user groups? Yeah, I think that does go back to the same thing with education, is just continuing that and then hopefully changing that culture of user. Rich. So uh, what do you know about the motivations of vandalism? Is it that people lack uh, areas to uh, shoot guns, or is this just because beer exists or some other? <laughs> uh, is there any study, or maybe that's future work or something? Because I'm just kind of wondering. Now, up in Alaska, we like shooting science too, but I'm just wondering <laughs> with the prevalence there, uh, maybe there are some underlying reasons that you can address those to reduce, and then you don't have to just have closure being your only solution. 
Um, you know, I'm not sure what the motivation is behind that. I mean, I like to go out and shoot, but I don't feel like I need to go out and shoot at random things like signs. And I like to go to shooting ranges and things like that. I'm not sure what that motivation is behind it. I don't know if it's alcohol driven. I don't know if it's more behavior driven. I think that there's a lot of factors um, that can go with that. So I, I'm not really sure what the answer to that problem would be. Or anti-government too, maybe. Or that. <laughs> Have, you know, just as, a, just as a comment, has your agency ever tried putting a very small uh, United States flag on the sign? in the corner or something for anti-government type situations, anti-control, you know, government control type situations. It seems to work pretty well. So, you know, just a suggestion. I like that idea. Thank you, Sally. <laughs> One thing I've seen uh, overseas work before, uh, I was in Prague a few years back, and they were having a problem with vandalism and actually designated a wall in the city to uh, like a graffiti wall, I believe it's called. And uh, yeah, like started removing, or they like started essentially like channeling this culture to that one place. Right? Mm -hmm. And it seemed to work pretty well. Yeah, I used to live in um, South Florida. Miami did that. They had a lot of walls that were designated for graffiti art, as they called it. And a lot of graffiti artists did take pride in being able to go over there and they protected those uh, walls and stuff like that. And it did, it didn't fix the graffiti problem, but it did help try to bring it down and minimize it a little bit. So, yeah, that is a good idea. Good time for and has there been there. any use of drones to sort of monitor continuously and get the data that way in terms of vandalism and uh, activity with vehicles and that kind of thing? I'm not sure what type of enforcement actions um, Washington Fish and Wildlife have taken. We don't have enforcement, um, I guess we don't really have an enforcement office through the Bureau of Reclamation. So I'm not sure what uh, Fish and Wildlife has done so far as that. <laughs> okay, my name is Tyler Lee. I'm the lead wilderness ranger with the Aspen Soper Stranger District. Um, today, my presentation is realizing the land epic implementing the Conundrum Hot Springs Overnight Limit Use Permit System. My project is about implementation and realization. It's about implementing a land ethic and realizing land health in a true management conundrum. Before we begin, I want to draw your attention to a quote from Jim Furnish. The finest tradition of American excellence calls for us to initiate change when conditions warrant and then take bold action. The world waits for leaders to step out without apology, to create a different future, create hope again, and again, and again. And also, before we dive in deep, I want to give you guys an idea of where the next two projects are coming from. Uh, this is the state of Colorado. As you can see, we have I-25 here, or I-25 here. This is I-70, Highway 50 down here. And this green patch right here, that's the Maroon Bell Snow Mass Wilderness. And this is the Conundrum Hot Springs. It's the highest elevation hot springs in North America. It's located within the Maroon Bell Snow Mass Wilderness, which is one of the original 1964 wilderness designations, and also really the iconic gem of Colorado wilderness. Um, you can access the hot springs through the Conundrum Creek Trailhead. There's other ways to do it, but that's the main way, and it's about an 8.5 mile hike, uh, one direction. This is also the Conundrum Hot Springs. <laughs> <laughs> Conundrum has a long history of resource degradation, over-visitation, and intense impacts. Conditions clearly warrant a change here. Over the past decade, there's been an increase in visitation by about 285%. Over the past four years, our wilderness rangers have packed out over 500 pounds of trash from the hot springs alone. It's a lot. And then just in 2016, our wilderness rangers noted 447 incidents of unburied human waste, trash, illegal firings, and improper food storage. The Aspen Sopers has tried many different things from education, various restrictions, designating campsites, and managing human waste to little effect. So it wasn't just wilderness rangers and managers who were noticing these impacts. 
The public and the media demanded action, and to the credit of the Aspen Sofer Stranger District, they acted. In November of 2017, they released an overnight visitor use management plan. This is a complex and novel adaptive management plan, but the gist is it addresses overnight visitation and biophysical impacts. It allows us to set aside zones in the wilderness area, monitor those zones, and if they exceed a threshold, implement a permit system. When the plan was released, there were several zones and areas that already warranted a permit. So knowing the large lift of implementing <coughs> these permit systems, it was broken into three phases, with phase one being Conundrum Hot Springs, which I'm here to talk to you about today. Phase two is Four Pass Loop and Capital Lake, which Lauren, who presents after me, will talk about. And then phase three, just monitoring for future displacement and future implementation. So following that decision to permit Conundrum Hot Springs and the phase one permit immediately, there was a lot of pressure on the Ranger District from the media, the public, and within the agency to succeed. Uh, permits are not necessarily novel to public lands. However, there hasn't been a permit on Forest Service lands in wilderness in Colorado since 1980, and that's the Indian Peaks Wilderness. So this pressure and need to succeed was the catalyst for my project. So when I found out about this project, I had to hit the ground running immediately in January of 2018, seeing as how the permit would go live in April <coughs> that same year. My project began as designing the actual permit system, taking that system, putting it into the website at recreation.gov, and then building an enforcement plan. After that, we brought in our internal and external stakeholders to teach them about the plan so they can communicate information. Around June, we brought on our field crews and we began field implementation and data collection. Um, in October, we entered that data, analyzed it, and currently we're at the point where we're looking at that data and adapting our current permit system. Uh, just to give you a better idea of the Conundrum Hot Springs permit zone, the permit zone is in red here. Um, up top towards the top of the screen, that's the Conundrum Creek Trailhead. So visitors typically start in this valley, and they come up valley, look at Silver Dollar Pond, that's the first permit boundary, and then we'll get to the hot springs where we have 20 designated sites, with each with its own individual capacity of two to six people. Um, most people then stay the night and then hike back out. Um, something else I just want to point out is here's Triangle Pass. You can't get into the hot springs from Crested View. Um, it's a little bit steeper. Uh, Triangle Pass is at 12,900 feet. So when I first began, my main focus was how are we going to enforce this permit system? So I built a strategic training and implementation plan. What I learned is if you take the time and put it into engineering to build a system that works, focus heavily on education and outreach to teach the visitors about the system, enforcement is rarely needed or used. And we'll be going over that in just a bit. So engineering, I broke engineering up into two components, on the ground and off the ground. On the ground was actually going in there and designating the actual sites, um, making sure that we mitigated hazards such as hazard trees, avalanches, and making sure that we can contain the sites and have them sustainable for future camping. Furthermore, on the ground was developing boundary signage, trailhead signage, any sort of signage. Um, these trailhead panels right here, we worked with Leave No Trace. Uh, we actually collaborated to create some strong and powerful educational messages. Um, something I just want to draw your attention to is this yellow box right here. Uh, before the permit, and we still do now, we provide free WAG bags, so they're human waste disposal bags, so visitors can pack out their human waste from the hot springs. So that leads us into the off-the-ground engineering, which was developing the actual permit system. So other land managers have done permit systems, so we reached out to them just to see what were their best management practices. What are the highest stay limits? Do you require a trip leader? Do you have to have your permit printed off? And then also we adapted other things, such as a block release schedule, so we released permits three times a year. Um, that was probably the majority of the work in engineering, was actually developing this permit. And then we took that permit and we plugged it into the recreation.gov website, working with their developers um, and their computer people that do things that I don't do with computers. <laughs> but we, we tested out with them just to make sure that this was actually what we wanted to see online for re recreation.gov. That leads us to education. Um, education was the make or break for this permit system. The reason why I've overwhelmed you guys with headlines is because of how much media outreach we've gotten in our local valley and also in Colorado on these hot springs. Um, this picture right here, you can see this is a reporter from the Aspen Times. Uh, these are two of the Leave No Trace traveling trainers, two of our awesome wilderness ranger interns, and then Katie Nelson in the background. A shout out to Katie Nelson. She's the project sponsor, also the wilderness manager, and she's really been a true champion of this permit system and helped guide our projects. Um, so next, we took the permit system and we created an educational curriculum 
and went to local businesses, to local nonprofits and volunteer groups and taught them about this permit system. The system itself has a lot of rules, which is why I'm not gonna go over it all today. Um, it's very complex and there's a lot of ambiguity. So we felt if we could get the local base up to speed on the permit, it would help enforce itself. Um, this is me out with the Forest Conservancy volunteers. They typically walk uh, near the trailheads on our trails. And then that leads us to finally, we trained our own folks, our own wilderness rangers. And this photo is taken from a three-day patrol academy. We had a conundrum specifically focusing on how to manage and enforce this permit system, which speaking of enforcement brings us to enforcement. Mm -hmm. Enforcement is presence. It's really, it was for us, it was really being out there and showing people that we cared. It wasn't going in and kicking in tent doors. It was just being out there. Um, luckily, we got a grant from the Aspen Environment Foundation that allowed us um, to have a ranger out there the majority of our patrol days. Um, as you can see up here, we have our wilderness rangers at patrol training where we are crafting key messages using authority of the resource from George Wallace to address noncompliance. And then really the largest part of enforcement was building the legality to enforce this permit system. Um, that had to go through an internal process where we needed a civil rights assessment, a needs assessment, another enforcement plan, and also tiering to our NEPA documents in our overnight business management plan. So we implemented the permit system. What happened? What did we see? I cannot tell you how extremely positive my experience was on the trail. Um, I did not anticipate that. How many people would pull me off to the side of the trail after I talked with them and tell me how great the area was after the permit, how easy the permit system was, and our, I think our, the quote that kept recurring was how clean the hot springs are. The people weren't just re referring to the water, they were to an extent, but just the general area had been a lot cleaner. But this is a data-driven planning panel. So what did our data say? In this graph right here, uh, this is conundrum overnight visitation from 2011 to 2018. The green line represents total visitation and the blue line represents the total number of groups. A couple things I want to draw your attention to. In 2015, this is when we see the peak of impacts and also correlating the peak of negative media. So following that here in 2017, we, this is before the permit, we actually did see numbers of visitation go down following that negative media. So what's interesting is in 2018, we see visitation return to these historic levels. I'll talk more about that in just a minute. This is looking at the permit in 2018 and based on visitation from states, uh, Colorado was the overwhelming majority with 72% of the visitation. Um, there were 44 other states. Uh, just to save you guys some confusion, I did not put 44 other pieces of the chart. <laughs> um, the average group size was 2.85, and we issued 1,567 permits in 2018 in the high use season. Just looking at the Colorado permits, the vast majority was from the Front Range in Denver, um, which does match our historic visitation around 70%. This was 80, over 80%. Um, just something to note in the blue pie graph right here, um, that was our local visitation in the Roaring Fork Valley, Aspen down to Glenwood Springs, about 10%. The average group size of Colorado's was 2.94. Uh, this chart right here shows trash packed out of Conundrum Valley. Um, again, we're seeing this theme that after 2015, we're seeing after that negative media, the numbers went down. Also a huge outlier in 2018, the very last day of the season, the very last patrol we packed up 50 pounds of wet blankets, so a large outlier. Um, this graph here shows tickets, issued, formally issued citations by rangers. Once again, 2016, and that was really in response to 2015, we're looking at 36 tickets issued, which is a lot for our wilderness program. Um, in 2018, we're down to two. Only one was for not having a permit in the permit zone. Uh, that same group did not have proper food storage. So, and then here, this, this uh, graph shows incidents. That's any time a ranger comes across trash, unburied human waste, et cetera. Once again, you can see 2016, 447, which is a lot. Uh, we're down to 74. Once again, a large outlier here, the very first patrol of this year's season. Most of the work we were doing was cleaning up the year before, mostly firings, about 60 incidents. So the graph on the left is the very first graph I showed you, a chart. And then the graph on the right is overnight ranger encounters. So that's every time a ranger encounters someone in the field. So the data here, we use registration, uh, trailhead registrations, which are these from about 2011 to 2017. So when a group showed up at the trailhead, they would fill out this registration and we knew they were going up the valley. Um, now we're using the permit data. So months ahead of time, they reserve this permit online. Um, 
it's what there's a really interesting trend I want to show here, and it's in 2018 in both graphs. So our current data is showing this return to historic visitation levels. Our encounter data is not. Our encounter data is showing this continuing trend of decreased visitation. So I have two hypotheses for what's happening here. So the first is that we're seeing use being distributed throughout the week. Historically, we saw visitation in the conundrum through our traffic counters from Friday to Monday over the weekend. Now with the permit from about mid-June to the end of August, all those permits are reserved. So that would make sense. We're seeing our visitation go out throughout the week. We mostly patrol on weekends-ish. So that's why our numbers are continuing to go down. But I don't buy it. I don't buy it from what I saw in the field. You know, what I question is whether these permits are actually being occupied. I question our occupancy, rate, occupancy rates. The people will reserve the permit ahead of time, months ahead of time in some cases. And are they actually going out there and are they not canceling their permit? So just something to think about. I think this is important to our data collection. Um, hopefully some folks from the Aspen Ranger District, Aspen Sofer Stranger District are watching. But it's important for our management plan to have accurate data that we were actually showing accurate trends. Regardless, these charts are showing a more prepared visitor. So coming back to Jim Furnish with the quote I opened up with, conditions warranted change here, and we acted. We implemented a permit system, which was restriction on how people use the land, and essentially a land ethic, if you will. But at what cost? Um, one of my favorite lectures comes from Dr. Melanie Armstrong over here. It's the problem solution, problem cycle lecture, where you have a problem and you address it with a solution, and that solution has inherent problems. It kind of never ends. Similarly, permits are not the silver bullet. They're not the one and done. They're not the total answer. Um, they're time intensive. It takes a lot of work. Lauren and I are just two people on a very large team. Um, they're costly. It's exclusive. And more importantly, we're limiting public use on public lands, which is not the intention and ironic. What I've learned from implementing this permit system and this land ethic is that both require management and time. Constant management, collecting data, acting on it, collecting more data, and changing course. The success of the conundrum permit, we can say it's successful so far, but the true success will be in the long term. And last, I'd just like to thank um, everyone involved with this project. Like I said before, this was a forest-wide effort. This was not just me in any sense, um, but some specific people I want to thank, Katie Nelson, uh, Shelly Grail, Karen Troyer, um, Recreation Staff Manager and District Ranger, and Melanie Armstrong. And also Lauren, because um, we tag team both of our projects. So thank you. Uh, I mean, for the resource, maybe that is a good thing. Yeah. Um, but what would you suggest in terms of, like, if that is happening, how do we adapt to that? Yeah, of course. I um, mean, also just to elaborate a little bit more, that's just from what we've anecdotally yeah. saw in the field. And there's no real way to come to a conclusion art is that what we're actually seeing. Um, so my recommendation is that we do try to capture occupancy. And I'm not sure the best way to go about that. Like you said, any break that that area can get is great, especially with all the revegetation re and restoration work that we're doing. I would like to see some way to collect, some metric to collect the actual occupancy of the campsites at the hot springs. And also, I think it's, I think we need to increase our messaging around canceling permits if you're not going to visit the hot springs. So it opens up that opportunity for someone else. Um, ideally, we're out here to serve the people and protect the land. Um, anecdotally, I was there in September and there were no permits available, and there were all, there were very few people there. Um, it, granted, it was like the last sunny day in the year, right? So I got really lucky. Um, but yeah, I wonder if there was maybe like a so you reserve your permit a month ahead of time, you know, in advance, and then a week or you know a few days before you get like a, a an email that says, "Are you still planning to come?" And then if not, then they it gets like sent back into the. You know, make, make made available. Exactly. Yeah, we, we do have a system that if you do cancel it, that permit will be available. So I think if, we, if there's a way that we can maybe send out an email um, just before their permit's going live that says, hey, if you don't plan on using this permit, please cancel. Oops. 
You want to go, Ethan? I'll go. Yeah, can you go back to your graphs, the two um, graphs? Which one? Okay. Uh, I don't know, two slides ago? A few slides ago. I, I was just curious why the two conclusions you came to were that you're missing people by only patrolling on the weekend or people aren't, um, yeah, the incidents maybe or encounters. Maybe I just don't quite understand what encounters means. Yeah, of course. Um, every time our wilderness stranger encounters someone, they write down the number of groups that they see and the total number of visitors in each of those groups. And if they're at, they've actually been pretty reflective up until about 2017 of our actual visitation that we see. And um, that's because we do patrol this area pretty heavily, knowing that there's a lot of impacts. Does that answer your question? Yeah, Ben? yeah, thank you. Get a price oh, on the Mr. Screen. Hadley. Hey, Tyler, long time no see. Uh, first of all, I just want to say you rock, and it's been great sharing an office with you. I've um, got two quick <laughs> questions. Um, yeah, number one, um, what do you think the uh, key was to the public um, accepting the permit system during the initial rollout? I mean, granted, uh, understanding that this, the public that's accessing this specific area is spread throughout the country and, and the state, not just the Aspen area. Um, and two, how do you foresee the Conundrum Creek Avalanche have an impact on managing that area in 2019? Price, I was actually ready for both of those questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, first of all, to your point, <clears throat> with the permit system, we knew the public was going to like it. Something that there's so much in this project I can't talk about, but with our overnight visitor use management plan, the public was the ones that were demanding us to do something, to demanding us to act. And there was so much public support, and I'm specifically talking about the local valleys behind that plan that we knew that people would be supportive of this permit system because that's what they asked for. Um, I did leave this at the end of the slide. Um, I, I thought it was quite ironic that one of our problems before the permit was trailhead parking. Unfortunately, um, that's not a problem anymore because the trailhead. <laughs> um, there's a large D, just, uh, avalanche with a D 4.5 rating. That's a destructive 4.5 rating. The scale's out of five. It, no one even knew it was possible to get close to a five in North America. Um, as you can see, there's where, where our trail panels. And... <laughs> so right now, the trail is closed price. And I think it's a really good question for how do we manage that with the permit system moving forward. Um, <laughs> We're working to try to get in there and close those and clear those areas as fast as we can. Um, also, just knowing that we have an entire ranger district that has the, all these same problems because there was avalanches everywhere. Um, so we're, we're just trying to reach out to our permit holders and let them know that this is a thing. We don't have any parking right now. Um, if you can get dropped off and climb over the trees, go for it. Tyler, yeah. unfortunately, we're out of time, but let's think. Hey. Hi. <laughs> Last one. All right. Um, my name is Lauren Atkinson, and I've also been working with Aspen Silver's Ranger District on phase two of the Maroon Bell Snow Mass Wilderness Permits. This presentation, however, is a little bit more about the planning because it fascinated me, and I'm hoping I can convey it in a way that also fascinates you. So before I begin, I actually have a brief poll. Okay, so raise your hand if you enjoy camping. No matter where it is. Okay, keep your hands up. And put your hand down um, only if you have never had to obtain a permit to go camping before. Okay, keep your hand up. And then well, now only put it down if you had to obtain a permit but were then able to disperse camp as in you could camp, you were assigned a zone to camp in, but you could put your tent down anywhere you wanted in that zone. Okay, so everyone kind of look around. Okay, great, now you can all put your hands down. And that final step there, being able to camp in a limited system through a dispersed strategy is the use of the land manager applying the minimum tool or the least invasive approach to managing that area to its desired condition. Okay, so in an effort to maintain visitor freedom and maintain these desired conditions within a limiting system, um, the 
Uh, <laughs> as I'm so first. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, the district called upon some help from people who have a little more experience in um, wilderness and permit planning. Um, so the National Park Service, how many people were on National Park Service lands when they had to get that permit and they could camp wherever they wanted? Great. So there's a couple reasons for that. One being the difference in missions. I'm pressing. Millie, I think you um, <laughs> the difference in the missions of the two agencies. So the Forest Service, for example, driven by the mission to sustain health, diversity, and productivity of nation's forests and grasslands doesn't exactly scream beautiful waysides, emotional connection to the landscape, and of course, fisheries management. But we're getting better. So our <coughs> service friends helped a lot in this process. So just for some continuity between this project, my project, the Thais project, um, phase two um, in this plan is the four pass loop in Capital Lake. zones. And just to kind of give you a geographical idea, a geographic idea of where these stand, this is phase one, success, given the thumbs up by Ranger Lee here. And um, remember what Tyler described as the Conundrum Hot Springs permit being a nice out and back user pattern from either our, the Aspen side or the Gunnison, Chris at Butte side, little shout out to the team out there. Um, and then phase two, we have an additional eight visitor use zones, seven of which have surpassed visitor use management thresholds with a dominant trail system encompassing six of these zones with trails spidering out from them to about eight different trailheads and then we have this slightly detached um, zone of Capital Lake that has also seen comparable resource impacts to Canada Possibles. So at Courtesy to the Public, um, we're looking to, um, Courtesy to the Public understanding what we're doing and understanding these actions, we are moving forward with multiple zones in the phase two part of the process. So the Forecast Pass Loop is becoming famous. Um, we don't have quite have the headlines as conundrum. There's many headlines as conundrum yet, but we have our own Facebook group. <laughs> and it has over a thousand members up from about 850 when I joined in um, the fall of last year. And another thing to note is what social media is kind of helping or kind of doing to raise awareness about sites such as um, these fabulous hikes, um, particularly in the Maroon Belt and Mass Wilderness. And something to note here is that the message is getting out that these places are getting busy and visitors are kind of starting to self-organize into different areas of the wilderness on their own um, through their own social media posts. So before proceeding though, I just want to take a step back and reiterate what Tyler mentioned that limited use permits are an absolute last resort for land use managers or recreation managers. We've tried the education. We've collected the data to figure out what people want. And we it hasn't worked. So in an effort to really, you know, do our duty to preserve these spaces for continued use and continued beauty, maintain the ecological integrity, um, or at limited use permit systems in the room bells and mass wilderness. So in a continued effort to maintain this wilderness character, um, how can recreation managers utilize the MoMA tool? or the least restrictive action necessary to mitigate these ecological impacts from overnight dissipation. So this project is primarily about permit planning and design, but um, if you ask if any member of my core team that planned this permit system, it is impossible to not think about these other three project phases simultaneously. And you'll see in coming up that they do share, they share data. Um, so just briefly, um, fee planning, um, once you implement a system, it needs to find a way, it needs to be sustained. Um, so fees are kind of the direction. And just to outline that, um, that when it comes to federal lands is the process is not guided by districts, it's guided by the Federal Lands Recreation Enhancement Act. So there is a process. Um, field, in, field implementation is what Tyler spoke to. So that's how many signs will go in the permit area to encourage or to paint that engineered structure to encourage people to comply. 
um, that also includes what will the science say, where will it go, um, and then um, trend moving towards the website content design, how will we build out this plan that we create in a pre-existing template, which is a conversation for another time. So um, I give you the permit plan as of April 30th, 2019. And um, this is actually in story map format, but I don't have it live right now. And please note that this is subject to change. Um, just I'll be aware that <laughs> this, is go, this is projected to go live um, next year, but there's a lot of time between now and then, and some micro adjustments may be made. But the one thing that we have settled on that I'd like to get into a little bit, because it is an interesting process and where the bulk of my work lied on this planning team, is our strategy for our camping. So in this, on this map, um, if you notice these um, black numbers in a polygon are the zones that will be permitted. And the number represents the number of groups that can sustainably camp in that zone per night. Okay, and we took that number. So the maximum group size for the wilderness is 10 people. So say we allowed these groups to max out every group at 10 people. There'd be 200 people in this zone, 90 per night in this zone, 170 in this zone, and so on. And we decided that that was not going to necessarily um, manage or rein in these impact, ecological impacts that we've been seeing that drives this plan. So um, we decided to split that into two quotas, one for small groups, and one for large groups. And based on our required registration data, this form that Tyler showed, we were able to collect information on group size. We learned that the average group size that visited the permit area was 2.48 people per group. Therefore, we broke groups down into a large group quota of 5 to 10 and a small group quota of 1 to 4 to leave us some growing room. So to kind of dive into that a little bit further, um, there were several major decision points along this process. And you know, the discussion continued in an effort to really utilize that least invasive action as managers to maintain the highest amount of visitor freedom we could within this system. So um, I'd like to kind of just guide us in more depth through the camping strategy. Um, and I'm going to kind of steal a project management tool um, <clears throat> known as inputs, tools and techniques, and outputs, or for those of you who bake, um, the ingredients, the recipe, and then the pancake. <laughs> <You're me. laughs> That's what I make. <laughs> so ingredients kind of outlines the um, what we started with. So this is what every planning project on federal land starts with. You have your federal legislation that guides the decision. You have the forest level plan, you have the current regulation, and then you have some options. Most plans usually start with some kind of options. So in the case of our camping strategy, we know people designate sites, or we know other land managers have designated sites. We know dispersed camping exists, and we know that sometimes there's a need to, or existing systems are in place to limit visitors within designated sites. And then this is the bulk of the list in this process, and the outcome is a regulatory action or a decision or a plan. So I kind of want to dive into the tools and techniques a bit because of our recreation uh, data theme here we have going on. So Tyler spoke to these um, trailhead registrations, winter reports, and campsite monitoring data collected by the Wilderness Program. Um, and then these are the phases, the key phases of the project that utilize each of these data sources with the trailhead registrations being of utmost importance in this case. And here is the, the main calculation we got from those trailhead registrations is our capacity metric. And we used this for every phase, every discussion of the permit project, permit process, including the, it's also going to be important moving towards the future. Uh, so this is just kind of an idea. This is that, this is what's already in place. Um, so this defined our parameters, and then that we analyzed our trailhead registration data to come up with these separate metrics to determine capacity for the permit area in individuals in groups per night under the large group and small group scenario. So 
after <laughs> eight four hour meetings with three to seven people and after kind of really tackling this stuff head on with all those other sideboards we talked about, we came up with a result or a plan. And I kind of already described the large and small group quota allocation, but we also paired that with a campaign strategy, knowing that large groups incur the, mo the most impacts because they're like 10 people pooped more than two people who are overnight in the wilderness. And then the um, small groups maintain the highest amount of visitor freedom based on what we know about small group visitation being um, average size 2.40 people per group. So that small group um, group size of one to four, we, you know, we figured that that group could probably handle still continuing to disperse camp. And then in certain areas, such as Capital Lake, Condom Hot Springs, and Crater Lake, so bodies of water is the theme there, um, it was necessary to do a slightly more confining action and, um, you know, not only maybe limit, reduce the size of each group to less than four people, but also, you know, designate that capacity in those sites and calculate that into our overall wilderness site. So as a visitor to the Maroonville Stillmass Wilderness, what can you expect to see on the ground? Well, this, this is a campsite in this permit area. So imagine five tents here in this photo instead of one, or 50 people in this meadow instead of just four. Imagine scars from fire rains leaving ruts in the meadow and partially burned logs sticking out of the scar. The point of this plan is to adaptively manage these ecological impacts from overnight visitation. But it also reinstates the potential for solitude in this landscape. The use of data-driven decision-making enables managers to monitor resource conditions, placing less restrictions on the visitor if use remains below indicator thresholds. A well-constructed permit plan has the ability to maintain visitor freedom even within a limited entry system. So the next time you're camping or recreating on public lands, make note of what you can do. Are you able to camp where you'd like? Notice the lack of signs or structures. Is it intentional? In the case of wilderness, the answer is always yes. <coughs> can recreation permit systems serve a restorative purpose? The minimum tool approach intends to preserve the natural and unconfined experiences that many of us seek through recreation in the wildest places we can reach. Thank you. This one's just for me instead of everybody else's. <laughs> So I know how important the value of inclusivity is to you as you think about wilderness and, and public lands. How do you feel about systems like this and the value of inclusivity? Are you asking for my personal feelings? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm sure that everybody in the Forest Service. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, th this is hard um, because this is limiting, very limiting probably the most limiting in some cases. But at the same time, um, there is balance, right? There's balance for wanting to be accessible, but we're kind of at a point in this wilderness area in particular where it's been accessible and that access has led to highly degraded or ecosystem conditions directly tied to this overnight use specifically. So, I think that's, I mean, that's the challenge in land management. I know I'm not going to really answer the question, but um, <laughs> it's important. And I think ways that we can make this area more inclusive specifically to underserved groups is perhaps through other avenues of forest service or land, man land management. And I'm thinking about um, special uses and how that program in the agency ties into access 
And I know it's still limiting, but um, this permit plan actually, we've, we've maintained the ability of our special use permit holders to use the wilderness area as they had before the permit was implemented. So, I mean, that could change in the future, but at this moment, that is the best way to be more inclusive beyond those who can make a reservation. Rich. Uh, so, I think what you're doing is great. Um, the Probably the worst wilderness, with quotes, experience I ever had was at 14 Camp on Denali with 300 other people around there. And so it's like, it was by no means a wilderness experience. And uh, so I'm kind of wondering, what's the follow-up? How can you reach out to your permit holders to get feedback from them of, well, what'd you think? How, are there ways to still improve it? And uh, in those kind of things. We actually piloted a program this summer in attempts to answer that question, <clears throat> to gain more insight on the visitor experience. So that program was rooted in citizen science. Um, so that's a way to collect, I shouldn't say that, I need to be careful of what I say because it's not a survey and that doesn't require a lot of oh. right? So it's oh. kind of just trying to, like, yeah, exactly like you said, gather information through um, a targeted project in which visitors can provide feedback. So I mean, creating infrastructure is the hardest part, infrastructure for free gathering that feedback, especially in the Forest Service, we don't have as many visitor centers staffed with yeah. people who can actually collect paper forms if you're working with that. Um, so maybe increasing field presence as resources allow, or um, yeah, coming up with other other tools to use, other, other avenues, other projects. Another question over here too. Oh, I'll go to Sally first, Chris. <laughs> Hang on. Hang on. Um, just a, going back to inclusivity, has there ever been a study done to determine once you put a permit system in, how much exclusion did that cause? to the population that was going there before. Not that I know of. Just curious. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah not that I know of. I know. I was, <laughs> that's a great topic, though. So should we get Price our last yeah, question? Yeah, let's get Price the question here. Thank you. Nice awesome job, Lauren and Tyler. Oh, um, actually, you know, Price, uh, I have a quick question. question. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you know, I haven't had ample opportunities to interrogate them about their projects throughout the time. But anyways, quick question. I'm curious how the White River National Forest decided, made the decision to put this permit system on rec.gov versus a staff, uh, I guess, office-based, um, first-come, first-service, or first-served permit system as they have done in the Indian Peaks Wilderness area that Tyler mentioned earlier. That's a great question. Um, I will start by saying, that it's based on resource availability. Um, and so the future projection of this project, just for full disclosure, is fees for the purpose of sustaining the permit, sustaining this hard work, healing the wilderness in a way through having field stuff on the ground. So Price, I wanna get to the Indian Peaks story because, um, <laughs> The Indian Peaks is struggling. Um, they're struggling based on what they, they have a fee in place right now in which they can retain fees on site. We did some math as to what they're actually retaining. They're retaining about 90 cents a person through their permit system. So price to compare what we're trying to do to that in terms of where we're starting, or we're starting in a different place. They implemented in the 80s, um, we're, you know, it's almost 2020 now. Um, so I think the Indian Peaks case, the choice to use recreation.gov is resource based. Um, and perhaps, you know, it's really intensive, it's really labor intensive to have staff a visitor center to issue permits. For example, really quickly, before we run out of time, um, Rocky Mountain National Park, a national park, I understand, different sources of funding, different use of fees, different distribution. However, 
They have 13 people staffing their backcountry office to specifically take backcountry reservations. We have six, five in the field. Five in the field. That's it. And like one person who organizes. So it's just it's just a resource availability based question price. And we have done some work to see what it would take to expand on the rec.gov provider, but at this point there's no other option. Then we have time for everyone, so let's give them a round of applause. I get to ask the first question and then I walk back in the room. <laughs> I want to compliment you all, first of all, on your excellent integration of poop into all of your communications. <laughs> this is like a high level for the MEN. <laughs> <laughs> A wonderful week of presentation. But I have a question actually related to something that Tyler brought up in terms of the reality that a lot of the enforcement of the permitting system was uh, done, funded by private entities. And of course, Mila and your presentation have this partnership with the Nature Conservancy. What do you see as the future for public land management in terms of public funding and public support? And what are the opportunities for collaboration with private entities, whether financial, volunteers, whatever that may be? I can start, I guess. Um, I know for us, the Forest Service, we're shifting our mission more to work more with partners. Um, and I think that's one way that we can accomplish some of the, a lot of the large tasks that we're dealing with, especially with uh, decreasing budgets, um, is working more with our partners in the Valley. I know at least for Lauren and I, our local partners are awesome. They're on top of it. Um, it's difficult, though, in other areas where you have that less availability and access to those partners. Um, ideally, it'd be nice to see the support coming through Congress, um, but that's not always the case. Um, yeah, I guess I'll add to that and just saying that um, the Nature Conservancy also utilizes a ton of partnerships, um, but it is a nonprofit, and so philanthropic endeavors um, lead the way for so much of their work. Um, and what I've seen working within the National Park Service is they have an adjoining um, conservancy that can take in those philanthropic dollars and then fund research that needs to be done when con congressional um, funds are lacking. Um, so I think through those partnerships and through um, donations of individuals outside of our taxpayer dollars, um, you can build a pretty strong network to continue um, doing work that we're doing. Um, but yeah, like Tyler said, I mean, it'd be great if everyone just valued it and we got the money we wanted. <laughs> yeah, I think like with my project working with um, Washington State managing our land because we don't have the enforcement authority, I think that that's a good thing because they have law enforcement rangers who can actually go out there and do enforcement action. And then also, even at the dam, we have a security force, but they don't have law enforcement um, Authorities, so we partner with the local police agencies, the sheriff's office, and different things like that, tribal police as well. So I think having those um, different partnerships in place can definitely help out, especially when funding is very, very thin. Groups. <laughs> <laughs> um, one thing, I have a question and a comment, I guess. The comment would be like, I've uh, heard a lot in the business school that the solution to pollution is dilution, but uh, I think I've learned from each one of y'all that it may actually be education instead. And uh, my question was, if there, or, uh, what was the plan B of the permit solution if there was one? Like instead of enacting a permit system, do you have another idea? Yeah, continue as, as is. I think it was, yeah, just to continue with education. Um, and really, that never stopped. Um, really, this, this was it. This was, it was the permit system or no permit system. And with the permit system, too, we're moving forward with heavy education because a permit alone still won't change anything. Good question. Oh. <laughs> um, yeah. Oh, oh sorry. Um, we heard the other day that. Uh, there, there were some devices that were used um, to track wildlife and, and also cattle movement and sheep movement in Powderhorn uh, down here to the southwest. 
a little bit. I'm wondering if that kind of equipment might be usable in a place like, uh, well, really, uh, where, where you're working and around the, the lakes and, and sort of the routing. <clears throat> Um, yeah, I can kind of tackle that. Um, my first reaction is that in maybe other situations that could be an option, but in wilderness, it's a sensitive topic. Yeah. Um, and I think specifically to the um, minimum requirements, MRDG and minimum requirements decision guidelines that the forest service or that wilderness areas are required to follow for that type of work. And we do that for some of the wildlife studies occurring in the wilderness. So translating that to visitors, um, we can actually, given our plan is really to track overnight visitation, even, even the most leave no trace cognizant individuals leave some type of mark, especially if it's repeated use. So monitoring these campsites the way that we do, um, there's a Rocky, the Rocky Mountain region of the Forest Service, which is Colorado, a little bit South Dakota, um, probably some other areas that came over right now. But the point is that there, there's, a, there's a way to rate impact um, of campsites that we tie to geographic locations via GPS when our rangers go in and monitor for these changing conditions. If I could add on real quick, to, in terms of just tracking cure visitation levels outside of the wilderness, there are popular trailheads. We do have the, the similar devices. If you listen to Kendall's presentations, mm -hmm. our presentation, we had traffic counters and infrared counters that are outside of the wilderness that shoot a little laser and we actually can track day use and overnight use through those. Eric. Uh, yeah, I guess um, following up on the, that question about shared stewardship or partnership, you all spoke to for sort of the current state and the importance of those partnerships in all your project areas. What do you see as the future or the most important needs for partnerships or shared stewardship in those project areas in the future? I might say it's a capacity issue, right? Um, we were just hearing Lauren talk about their field staff versus a permitting office staff in Rocky Mountain. And so um, personnel capacity, I think is something that, yeah, collectively you can everyone can have a few extra individuals that really can make a huge difference. Um, and yeah, in terms of looking at the data, those personal interactions, like trail signs do inform our visitors, but one-on-one -on -one interactions really do propel um, change behavior. And so the more people you can have to promote those messages, the better um, dispersed and instilled that information can be. And so, yeah, I don't know, you guys are not, but I would say personal capacity. I would add on to just the double-edged sword nature of partnerships. On top of that, you need internal capacity to manage partnerships. Um, you need actually capacity to coordinate that. So there still does need to remain some field level or some internal presence at some point. If I can add to, um, partnerships are, I don't want to call them a buzzword, but they seem to be becoming that in the way that they're used. Um, and sorry, Partnership sorry, M.E.M. -E <laughs> um, I don't teach it. But, but here, so I should, I should. What I meant by that is that partnerships are changing, right? So media partners, for example, are becoming so essential because think about. Like what we have six wilderness rangers for 181,000. No, it's like 200,000 acres all combined. Wilderness all wilderness of our wilderness, wilderness areas, areas combined. We have six rangers. Mm -hmm. So, you know, most people get their information well before they come to sites these days. So, seeking partners in ways to disseminate that information, I think, is the way of way of the future. Way things need to go. I think one problem with partnerships as well too is that you have to have accountability for them. And if you find that your partnerships or your partners are not doing things the way that you're supposed to, you're gaining that benefit of having them there and you want to correct their actions, but how hard do you come down on them um, if they're not following the rules because you don't want to lose that. So I think especially when it comes to funding, you don't want to lose that opportunity. So it's kind of a very fine line sometimes that you have to walk with your partners. We're going to do one more question. Corey Knapp. 
Do you I want the final question? The last question, but I, um, I guess I will be. Um, <laughs> I know that you guys are all talking about permits and kind of impacts on the ground. And one thing that I just feel like we have such a strong sense of, of Colorado and who we are and how we're housed in this state. And so what are your thoughts about, this doesn't take care of the permit problem, but just like the funding, funding for public lands problem. What do you think about a kind of like an ATV um, license for hikers and bikers and backpackers? And would that be a way, even if it was voluntary to benefit all public lands, it just seems like we have support from, I mean, people love being in the state. But I, I want to get your thoughts about what you think about that as an option. I guess I can speak personally. Yeah, I, I think because it, it's a pay to play model. Mm -hmm. If you're actually out there using these resources, similar to if you drive an ATV, those trails get maintained, and you have your ATV license. Mm -hmm. I think it's something that we have to start looking into, especially as Coloradans. I, I mean, it's a well-known statistic that population is gonna pretty much double by 2050, and it's, it shows no sign of going down with this, see more visitation. Um, it is also an exclusive model. When we're talking about inclusivity, and access to these places, that's a large barrier. So it's difficult. I can't really speak on behalf of Colorado because I live in yeah. Washington. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, Washington State requires a discovery pass for any of these recreational sites. So it's basically putting the burden on the user instead of on just the taxpayer base in general. And it's been very, very popular. A lot of people do um, buy these discover passes. They're very inexpensive. And it gives you access to not only these areas or in the Columbia Basin, but throughout the entire state and places on the coast as well. And it's been pretty well received within the state. Yeah, I don't know if I can answer that in terms of my work. Um, I mean, these are definitely kind of the next level of like supporting yourself while trying to provide these services. Um, Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if I've got a direct answer for you, sorry. I would frame that in, I think rather than charging individuals, for example, for a human, or I guess, ground travel or not non-motorized, non-mechanized travel is a tough sell. So I think the way it sounds like, from what I gather, on the recreation industry, that the direction being headed is to present the story about the greater benefit of recreation. So it's not just like a pay to play type system at a particular site. It's framing it in terms of um, a community, like creating um, gateway communities, like Ingla has a model right now, that which Trail Conservancy has a model right now, creating these stewardship communities to like kind of seek econ or reap up an economic some of the economic benefit from the visitation that drives recreation in these places. Mm -hmm. So I guess it's kind of it's not necessarily charging one user group um, for a type of recreation. It's trying to kind of spread out the economic benefit in a way so that kind of more people I guess are throwing money towards particular use in an area, if that makes any sense. But <laughs> well, don't clap, Ethan. <laughs> That's Master Ethan. <laughs> um, Ethan White, call me M.E.M. Don't clap yet. <laughs> um, I can still take it back. Oh, I don't think you can. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, for the final time, this wonderful cohort. It's been an incredible series of master's projects. Congratulations to all of you and congratulations to these new masters of environmental management.